Howdy. Uh, we're going to try again. We're going to try and do our first refinement with GSAS2. Um, so I've just opened GSAS2. And what we're going to work with today um, is an example uh, of quartz data. Um, so I've downloaded a .raw data file. .raw is a broker. It's a commercial um, binary data format. Um, and I've also got the SIF file in hand here. So remember refinement, you always are starting from a known position. Um, and so this is our first guess of what silicon uh, dioxide or quartz uh, structure is going to look like. Uh, and we know it's going to be a pretty good guess because a lot of people have looked at this before. Um, so the first thing we need to do is go ahead and bring in our data. Um, and so we can import powder data. In this case, we're coming from a Brooker raw data format. And I just am browsing to where I had downloaded it. It might be different uh, location for you. Um, and uh, it's going to ask for an instrument parameter file. Um, and so that's basically a bunch of um, uh, a bunch of information about the diffractometer. And we're, we're not going to, uh, we're going to assume that we don't know that for now. And so I'm going to say cancel and use the defaults for the copper K-alpha lab data. Um, and so this is a pretty good first guess of what uh, your diffractometer data should look like. Um, so if I brought in the data properly, I should see something like this. Um, and all of these blue X's are actually observed data points. You can hit the uh, magnifying glass and zoom in uh, at a point here and hit the home button and come back out. Um, and the first thing uh, that we're going to do is we're going to set some limits on that data. Uh, and the reason we're going to do that is if I zoom way in here, um, all of these sharp things are peaks that we're interested in. This broad hump at the beginning is uh, a signal from an amorphous background. So this either means that we have some um, amorphous SiO2 mixed in our sample, or more likely we actually um, were shining a little bit of x-rays on a, a plastic uh, um, sample holder, uh, and that's what's responsible for that peak. But that's not uh, data that we care about, uh, and we're not going to worry about that in this refinement. And so I'm going to say, uh, you know, pick an angle somewhere down here, let's say maybe uh, 16 degrees to theta, or you could use 18, something like that, um, that is before the first peak, I mean, we're going to use that as our new cutoff. Um, and so once I do that, now all of the refinement is really only going to apply between 18 and 70 degrees to theta. Um, so each of these things basically um, are describing some aspect of the overall data set. Um, background is basically just um, this, uh, how much intensity we expect to see when we're not on a peak. Um, and so the very first thing uh, that we want to refine is that, but I, I am remembering now that I haven't done another very important part, uh, which is to bring in uh, a phase. Um, and so right now it sees our raw data, but it doesn't know anything about the um, starting point of the refinement. And so I'm going to import a phase from a SIF file. Um, and again, this is the SIF file for quartz. And do I want to read this file? Yes, I do. And I'll go ahead and rename that to be... Uh, quartz. Um, so just as a side note, uh, if you ever uh, are looking for um, a SIF file, uh, you can go to Open uh, Crystallography Database, um, which is at crystallography.net, uh, and you can search for a particular compound. And these are all open source, so anybody can easily access them. And that's where this starting guess is from as well. Uh, and so we're going to go ahead and add it to this data set. And so I check the box and I say, okay. Um, and if I look at it now, under, uh, under phases, I have something present. So if you don't have uh, something here, that means you haven't imported your phase properly. So this is the starting the first guess uh, for what we're starting for. But um, again, we're going to um, start off by just uh, refining um, the uh, scale factor uh, and the, the background um, and the way we actually run a refinement is we click, click Calculate, Refine. And so, um, and you can save it somewhere. Let's call this Test, Saving on my Desktop. Um, and it goes ahead and runs it. Um, and all of these, if I uh, zoom back out, um, we can see it actually did a, you know, a fairly good job at the very first guess. So the, again, the blue um, uh, data points are our observed data. That green curve is the model. And the, the model is already pretty darn close to the observed data, so that's good. Um, so that was a low angle peak. We can look at a high angle peak too. Um, and we'll talk about where to go from here. 
Um, the red is the background. And so if I zoom out and I just uh, zoom in very low intensities along this red curve, I can see that that background is doing a pretty good job running through all these blue points in between peaks. Um, right now, uh, there are different functions that you can fit for the background. Um, uh, and, and for something like this, it's not going to matter a lot. We can go ahead and add a few additional coefficients. Um, it turns out that the RWP, so this single number that's calculated that describes how good your fit is, it depends an awful lot on how good of a job you're doing fitting your background. Um, so you can get that number lower just by adding more parameters into your background function. So I can say calculate, refine, run again. Um, and you can see that right now it gives us kind of a weird little wiggle here, but that's going to start to go away uh, as I correct um, the data for the peaks. So the general principle in refinement is that you always want to um, identify which things are the furthest off and work on refining them first. And how you do that is you zoom in and you look at your peaks. Uh, and I can already see that my position of peaks is not quite right. So I see data that's to the left of the peak here, and my data points are to the left again of the model curve. I also see this sort of up and down signal from the fit. Um, if I zoom out and I come and look at high angle peaks, it's even more obvious. Um, so in all these cases, it looks like that blue observed peak is to the left of where the model is putting it. Uh, and so that tells me um, that something is off with the peak position. Remember these little blue hyphens here are what is designating the position of the particular peaks. Um, so peak position is due to a couple things. Um, it is due to lattice parameters. And so I can uh, refine the unit cell. Um, but even before that, uh, I'm going to start off uh, defining, um, let's see, do, 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 background coefficients, sample parameters. So the scale factor I've already done. Um, and I'm going to define sample displacement. And so sample displacement is just talking about uh, if, the, um, uh, if the sample is not quite in the center of the goniometer. If it's a little bit higher or a little bit lower, that tends to shift all of those peaks. Um, and so if we do this and we want run refine, okay, um, we can already see that that did a lot of better job um, uh, taking care of that offset without even changing anything about uh, the, um, the unit cell lattice parameters. See, so the peaks are a lot better aligned now than they were before. Um, but I can go ahead and come back in here and in the phase, uh, turn on refine unit cell, because now this is going to allow these A and C lattice parameters to vary a little bit. Um, and uh, that should get us even closer. And so I can see these numbers have changed a little bit. I basically added some things out here on the fourth and fifth decimal place, but it didn't change too much. Um, uh, again, if I zoom in on a peak, you always want to come back and look at the actual peaks themselves, because that's what's telling you what to do next. So I don't have that um, just up and down signal anymore. Now I have something that kind of looks like a W, down, up, down, up. Um, and if I zoom in here. Um, I'm, you know, kind of seeing the same thing. Some of these peaks are high, some of these peaks are low. Um, let's come back out here. Let's look at something like this. Um, again, some of these peaks are looking a little bit low. So at this point, it looks like I have an issue with my intensities um, and potentially an issue with the peak shape as well. Um, so if I uh, see something um, like this where some uh, peaks are under predicting the data, some peaks are over predicting the data. That's telling me my intensities aren't quite right. Uh, and if I see something like this where the overall intensity is good, but I kind of see a down, up, down, up, or, or, or the opposite, um, then that means my peak shape isn't right. So there's some intensity out here on the tails that I'm not accounting for. I'm actually over predicting intensity on this part, but then under predicting it on the actual peak itself. If I zoom in a little bit more, sometimes you can see that. So you see the model is a little bit lower than predicted, uh, or I'm sorry, the model is lower than observed data on the tails, and then it's higher than observed data, uh, and then it's lower again. So this means um, that it's not the intensity that, that's off. This is telling me something with my peak shape is off as well. Um, so, so those two things are um, uh, affected by different um, parameters. So um, peak 
uh, intensities uh, are affected by the position uh, and the, the thermal parameters of atoms within the unit cell. Um, and if I double click on refine, I could um, hit the X that is um, going to refine peak positions. And I could check the U as well. I'm going to leave it here for the moment, being though I'm only going to refine coordinates first. Um, and the one thing to check is that depending on what crystal structure you're looking at, in some cases, the peak positions, X, Y, and Z, are, are fixed in the unit cell. So if you see something like 0, 1 half, 1 half, um, that's a good indicator that um, even if you try and refine the peak position, um, because of the symmetry of that unit cell, it's not allowing that particular atom to move to a different location. Um, so I can come under here, calculate, refine, run again. And so this, this running number, this RW, um, is the... Um, weighted residuals, and this is basically as this as my fit gets better, this number is going to get lower. And so you can reduce how good your fit is to a single number, but again, I'll say it again, and, and all of the other um, you know uh, tutorials and guides on how to refine or how to refine XRD data are going to say the same thing. Your best um, indicator of how good of a job you're doing is to look at the pattern, look at the peaks, and see uh, where you're doing well uh, and where you're falling short. Um, so our intensities are not quite matching up um, still, um, but we also have some issues with the um, uh, the shape. So again, I kind of see that that indicative W um, uh, kind of shape. So I'm under predicting here, over predicting, under predicting a little bit. Um, so let's try and address peak shape parameters. So um, in real practice, what we would do is we would run a very well-known standard um, that has large grains and no strain. Um, and that would tell us something about how our, our X-ray diffractometer works. Um, and then once we know that, that's the information that goes in that instrument parameter file, uh, we could use that same uh, setup for any other unknown sample. And we would know that in those cases, the, if we do see peak broadening, um, then it's indicative of something going on in the sample. Um, so uh, as an example, um, under phases quartz data, um, if I had a very fine-grained material, so nanometer uh, uh, length scale grains, um, or hundreds of nanometers at least, if I had a lot of residual strain, that would start to broaden the peaks. Um, but we're going to treat this quartz as our reference material. Um, and that means that the things that are causing it not to line up perfectly uh, are because of the uh, we don't have the instrument parameters um, down just right. And specifically, these UVW terms and XYZ, these are basically um, terms that show up in the Gaussian and the Lorentzian portion um, of the peak. Uh, if you remember, I'm going to zoom in on one of these particular peaks. You know, each peak is fit by some particular function. Um, and the function that we use in, in XRD refinement is called a pseudovoit. And that's just a linear combination of a Gaussian peak uh, and a Lorentzian peak. Um, and if you're, if you're very observant, you'll see that peaks actually have a shoulder or um, up at higher angles. Um, they actually are doublets, and that's because um, the radiation that we're working with, it actually has two very closely spaced wavelengths, K alpha 1, K alpha 2. Um, but coming back to the topic at hand, the peak shape issue, um, these UVW terms describe the um, the 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 distribution of that peak, of the Gaussian component, component um, and the XYZ uh, describe the Lorentzian component of the peak. So these are our peak shape parameters. Um, and again, it's best to do that on a, a known um, uh, standard material like this quartz. Um, and then you can apply, and then you would fix these as you look at your other unknown parameters. Now, when you start refining UVW um, and if you go to XYZ, the, the issue in a lot of cases, these are very strongly correlated terms. And so you have to be careful about um, just clicking a whole bunch and telling them to refine together. Usually that leads to trouble. Um, so it's best to refine um, them individually first. Um, and then once they're a little bit closer, then to try refining them together. The other thing is that um, U and W and XYZ should all remain positive. V should always remain negative. And so if you do something where, let's say we try and refine U, and we say calculate refine, 
Um, and if this number had gone negative on us, uh, then that's a sign that something uh, is not working right. Um, and so you can easily just, you know, go back a step or reset this to two um, and try again. But I'm going to kind of do these individually first. So that I have a positive number. Let's refine here. So that's still negative. That's good. And let me refine W. Um, uh, and that's uh, still positive, and that's fine. Actually, so the other um, thing that I didn't do but I should have done is when we're, uh, uh, let me make sure I, yeah, under sample parameters. When we're refining UVW, usually you want to turn sample displacement um, off because those can have some um, uh, not favorable <laughs> interactions between each other as well. Um, so now that I've done each of these individually, I'm going to go ahead and um, I'll let them all refine together. And hopefully we don't go too um, far afield so things still look okay. I can go through one more re refinement cycle. Um, and they seem pretty stable. Um, so I'm actually going to turn these off. Let's come back to our powder pattern. Um, and if I look here, you know, our tails still aren't quite right. Um, and it turns out the Lorentzian component is more important uh, in the tails. So the Lorentzian part of the function um, can contribute some significant intensity um, to the tails. Let me look up at a different higher angle peak just to see the same thing. Um, but that might not totally solve it. So in this case, I just have the intensity is higher than uh, the observed data. Um, but there's nothing wrong with uh, at least giving um, it a shot in terms of looking at what happens as we start to um, refine LX. That didn't seem to have too much of an effect. So that's not actually changing things, I think. Um, so I'm going to leave these here. I'm going to go back to uh, sample parameters, turn displacement back on, uh, and we'll run the refinement one more time um, just uh, to be thorough. Um, and so we're doing a better job. Um, the thing that we're not um, getting right now is intensities. Um, and so if I look at these, you know, um, this one, the shape is still not perfect. So let's kind of look in here. You know, in general, we're either um, uh, under predicting like this one or this one, or we're over predicting like this one, this one, this one. This is an under prediction, an over prediction. So our individual intensities for each of these peaks is not quite right. Um, so we can come back to phases and we can try uh, one additional thing. And we hadn't done this before, um, but we can actually try refining um, this U ISO term. Um, U ISO, or sometimes it's called B ISO, this is a parameter that describes uh, thermal vibration. So um, basically, it's trying to, you know, um, treat atoms as points in space. And so there's some known electron uh, density associated with that point. The larger the U ISO is, the more diffuse and spread out um, that point is. So this is another thing where you, you want to be um, a little bit cautious and, and make sure you're keeping an eye on what these U ISO values are. Um, I've seen automated refinement programs that, you know, you, you click a button and it tries to do the refinement for you and it can have an incredibly close match, but then you come back and you look and, and you get uh, non-physical, non-realistic values. So if this starts to get very large, um, then you should start to question it because it's probably not um, really reflecting a physical reality. So I will come down here, calculate, run the refinement again. Um, and let's just run it one more time. So we're kind of sitting here at this 17.5%. So this is, honestly, that's not so great. Um, we should be able to do better. My guess is this is just a, a data set that we pulled off um, a lab system. Um, and, it, you know, because the intensities are off, um, there's a chance that we have some sort of preferred orientation going on uh, in this particular sample, uh, depending on how you prepare the sample. Um, you can actually unintentionally introduce some uh, orientation and alignment uh, effects, and that, that would um, cause certain planes to look higher than others. Um, these are things that you can uh, try and work out in the refinement process, um, but we're not going to go through that step today. Um, I will also kind of bring us back here one more time so we can see that as we've done a better job fitting the peaks, um, the background itself, you know, again, it's not perfect. We're sort of under predicting uh, the values here. Um, but we did have a, initially we had sort of this broad peak over here that 
um, has gone away as we have as we've gotten a little bit better. Um, so we're going to call it good for now. Um, that is uh, an example of how you can work through your first refinement. Um, and I would recommend that you do this with the quartz data um, that has been provided. Uh, and the thing that you can do is once you've done this with this reference data, you can take your instrument parameters here and you can use this as your new starting point. Um, and so that's going to be a little bit closer uh, to the peak shapes um, that you would expect to see um, for some other unknown sample that's run on that same uh, diffractometer system.